thank you uh, to Shandy and Tim. Uh, I'm really excited to, to give you all a talk tonight. And uh, I think I'll talk about the Elwha Dam removal tonight. You know, I was thinking about going over a recent paper that I published, but I figure that we've all had enough bad news in the world recently. So let's, let's have a little more uplifting talk today. And I can come back at another point here sometime over the course of the next year and, and give the talk on the changes in run timing and uh, abundance for winter steelhead. Uh, so we'll talk about the Elwha today. And, and for those of you who don't know, and, and Shandy mentioned, I had been working for Trout Unlimited the past eight years, and I recently took a new job with a group called the Conservation Angler, uh, a very small group. Um, it's going to be myself as a scientist working with about three lawyers. And so part of it is you, you end up getting a little frustrated after 30 years in the business of, of seeing us nibble around the edges a little too much. And I felt like with the collapse of our steelhead runs in the Skeena, Columbia, across much of the North Pacific, maybe it's time to be a little bit more aggressive. But the, the main reason I took this job was up until very recently, uh, the, the conservation angler has been leading uh, and doing science work on, on the last pristine, truly wild populations of steelhead that we have left over in Russia on the Kamchatka Peninsula. And I was supposed to go over there this summer and spend two and a half months in that field camp working with scientists from Moscow State. Um, now with the Ukraine issues and Russia's bad behavior, that is not going to happen this summer, which sucks. So, uh, but nonetheless, hopefully, hopefully by the end of next summer, you know, uh, I'm there. So in any case, uh, at some point in the future, I'll have some cool stuff to talk about with Russian steelhead, hopefully. Uh, before I get into <clears throat> any of the results today, the first thing I always want to mention when I give this talk is literally, I might be the one that's presenting the results today, but this has really been a team effort, you know, Lower Elwha Clallam Tribe, um, NOAA Fisheries, National Park Service, USGS, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, WFW, uh, Bureau of Interior. There's just been a lot of people that have come together, um, scientists, technicians, policy people that are out there collecting data to help us answer these questions. So um, when I talk tonight, I'm, I'm just one voice literally standing behind an army of people who have done a bunch of good work. Uh, and so tonight, my, my focus is, my interest in the Elwha is mostly the fish. I'm, I'm very interested in geomorphology and river dynamics, but, but I love animals. And, and so that's why I became a fish biologist. And so we're going to talk a little bit about kind of what has happened since dam removal. And I'll focus mostly on steelhead, coho, and chinook. Uh, we'll talk about how far upstream they've made it, how many fish there are, and we'll close um, talking about summer steelhead and then um, a few of the kind of non-salmon related findings that we have that I think are cool. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Elwha, uh, this is a map. Uh, you can see on there where the former Elwha Dam and Glines Canyon Dam were located, um, River Mile 5 and then River Mile 13. Neither of those dams had fish passage. So because of Elwha Dam at, at, at River Mile 5, basically 90% of the accessible and address habitat was blocked. And that resulted in a reduction of steelhead and salmon by about 98%. So it was basically a wholesale collapse after having the dams in for a little over 100 years. This is a photo of the Elwha Dam uh, prior to removal. On the right-hand side, you can see uh, kind of a figure that displays uh, how much sediment was stored behind the dam. Um, and it was a lot, you know, there's the Empire State Building and there's an Olympic track. So it's almost 5 million cubic meters of sediment behind it, but it's not nearly as much as we had had behind the dam further upstream. But this is what it looked like after the dam was completely deconstructed in 2011. And here's Glines Canyon Dam, much taller, um, storing a lot more sediment, basically about three times the amount of sediment behind it that Elwha Dam um, was stored and, and here is a picture of it deconstructed in, in 2014. And so one of the kind of cool aspects of this was this is a, a transect where Amy East and other geomorphologists basically took pictures and measured the substrate size. And so in September 2011, this is down by the mouth of the Elwha River. And these are all uh, pictures of the same exact plot. That's before dam removal in September 2011. April 2012 is during the process of dam removal. You can see how all of that coarse cobble kind of filled in with a bunch of sand and mud. 
And by, you know, August 2012, we're already starting to see what we call a coarsening of the sediment. That is, you're starting to transport out that really small, fine sediment stuff, and you're leaving behind um, more pebbles and, and other kind of normal size sediment. So that, you know, that's 10 years ago now, but that just gives you a sense of how rapidly the river was transporting that sediment out that was located behind the dams that was occurring pretty rapidly. And it kind of looked like a moonscape. You know, this is a photograph of the uh, Elwha River above Elwha Dam where former uh, Lake Aldwell was. So this was the old lake bed. And basically they came in before they built the dams and logged all the forest, but it was a lot of mud basically draining into this. It was, what it reminded me of, in fact, is as a kid, <clears throat> I grew up about 35 miles from Mount St. Helens as a crow flies. And so it reminds me of post Mount St. Helens Toodle River. That's kind of the, the look it gives you. And of course, this was really hard on the fish, right? You know, we got suspended sediment loads up to levels that were comparable to some of the areas, you know, that were not directly impacted by the debris flows that came off St. Helens. But we're talking the sediment loads were much higher than we would see in a normal debris flow. So it, it was hard on the fish. We, we estimate that about 95% of the juveniles and 95% of the macro invertebrates that lived in the river below the dam died during dam removal. Uh, I'm not sure if this video is going to play, but this is a picture um, here. We'll try and get the video just showing how the river is starting to erode all that sediment that accumulated behind those dams. And so all this sediment up here was basically under a lake bed. But does this play for you, Shandy? Can you see the video playing? Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah. A little. So, you know, related. a little sketchy. Yeah, yeah. But you guys get, the, you all get the gist of it, which is this is during a flood event. It's coming down as just kind of eroding all of that sediment that had that had been stored behind the dams and, and trees were kind of falling in like crazy. So it was, it was pretty fun to watch, uh, but it wasn't just uh, that it was eroding things. One of the other things we began to realize is that out here on the floodplain were all these old stumps that had been logged. You can still see the, the buck marks, the buckboard marks in them. And, and these things were kind of fossilized. They looked like they'd just been logged the other day. And what we didn't account for was that all of these old stumps might actually contribute to habitat complexity, helping us form pools and ripples on these old lake beds and also helping collect more wood. So this was kind of a surprise. We didn't know those stumps were there because they were all buried under all of the sediment. Um, and of course, after winter, you come back in summer and it's really dry and cracked. It looks a little bit, you know, like one of those shots out there from the Death Valley. Uh, so it went through these extreme transitions really muddy, really wet, then having everything dry. Uh, but fortunately, what we did find was that these big old stumps collected a tremendous amount of wood, and they really helped um, improve channel dynamics and habitat formation for salmon on these old uh, lake beds. And this is kind of a broad shot there of what it, what it looks like. So it looks very different now some point uh, I'll put together a presentation that kind of walks people through, you know, 12 years of dam removal. But the point is, is that this is all lake bed. Those stumps were initially, before the dams were out, they were all covered by about 10 feet of sediment. So the river took all that 10 feet of pretty soft sediment off and, and moved it out within basically one flood and then started cutting down through the channel to uh, excavate down to these stumps. And so the question that people have often had is, well, boy, what did the fish do during dam removal? That must have been pretty tough, and it was. But we had a couple of tributaries in the middle river between the two dams where we got to move fish into tributaries that were not directly impacted. So we did relocate some adults, but we also had a little creek that comes out of the hatchery in the lower Elwha. And you can see in the picture here, there's a, a female steelhead spawning um, down there in that circle. And so basically what happened is that most of the steelhead and other fish as they needed to seasonally spawn they were all kind of pulling into this little creek and, and spawning in there in quite high densities and that was okay for us because that allowed us to then capture the fish with seines and then relocate them upstream to these tributaries uh, where they didn't have to deal with the sediment but another cool part of the sediment was even though it resulted in kind of this really rapid death and destruction of a lot of life within the river um, in about two years, actually, I should say three years, we had a very uh, large um, delta 
form at the mouth of the Elwha that was not present before dam removal. And this is, again, was at least to me unexpected. I didn't think a lot about the river mouth, but uh, we've got a large delta. It's created a lot of uh, this kind of intertidal habitat that's very important for juvenile salmon uh, and other species like Ulicon, but also birds. And so it's been really fun. And the surf break for those people who surf is way better there now than it, than it had been. So that's the other cool part is, you know, you know, dam removal doesn't just help the fish. And those of us who love that, you know, the surfers are up here in, in droves. So that's pretty cool to see, too. Uh, and so here we are with a picture about nine years after dam removal. And again, this is one of those areas that have been covered under a lot of water. And you can see how all the wood is starting to really shape the channel and, and store gravel. Uh, and if you remember those stumps, you know, I spend a lot of time out there underwater. And so here are adult Chinook. Uh, basically, every species is now out there on these old lake beds, kind of hiding under those old stumps. So the stumps have not only created habitat, but they're also providing shelter and cover. But the big question is, is well, that's all cool. What's happening above the dams, right? Because the whole goal is to get these fish up to this habitat in the national park that is basically in pristine condition. This is Geyser Valley, located about nine and a half miles above the uppermost dam. This is pristine habitat, really never been touched. Uh, and so there was kind of a, a different process for all these fish. A little explanation needs to happen. So uh, for winter steelhead, and coho salmon, they're both hatchery and wild fish. Uh, but for the coho, they're mostly hatchery uh, because, uh, because the dams were in place, there was not enough habitat in the lower river to really support an all natural population of coho. So basically what we did was the year before the dams came out and then during dam removal and for a couple years immediately following, we started relocating adult coho salmon up into tributaries and the main stem Elwha. We fitted some of those fish with radio tags so we could track them. So the gist of it is that not all the fish that were initially seen up there spawning and using habitat got there volitionally on their own, right? We, we did move fish to give them a head start. Now, the steelhead uh, were a combination. Almost all the early steelhead we moved were wild fish. We have a broodstock hatchery program. Um, and once those adults started to return, then we started to also move some of those fish. Uh, all relocation ended in 2018, and since then, it's been all natural colonization. And so basically the way we're measuring the response of salmon to dam removal is we're using red counts in areas where we can actually count reds because the water's visible enough, you know, clear enough to see them. We're also using snorkel surveys to do the same thing to count juveniles and adults. Uh, and we're using uh, radio telemetry, as I mentioned earlier. And so this is a photograph of, of two wild winter steelhead. You can see there's a radio tag on the back of each of these fish, and, and they were being released into a small creek. And uh, here are three steelhead. Uh, the one in the middle was actually one of the very first natural colonizing fish that we saw making above the dams. And kind of a cool story is... Uh, the tribal fellow that I work with is also my best friend. His name is Ray Moses, and him and I spend a lot of time out in the field. He's a he's he's Nez Perce. His wife is Elwha, and so we're out here. We moved a bunch of steelhead up, relocated them. About two days after we did the the third or fourth fourth relocation, we saw a large male steelhead, about 17 or 18 pounds, move in. Um, and was mating with females that we had moved. And we knew that we hadn't moved a male that large up there. We would have clearly noticed it. But the point is, is that by moving females around, females discharge ovarian fluid. Other males can smell them from several kilometers away at minimum in a river. So it's likely by relocating adults, we were able to stimulate males to basically follow around the females. So not much different than high schoolers. Uh, so again, how, how far upstream? you know, a lot of the same same methods, again, that I talked about there. So um, we have steelhead on the left and coho map on the right. And with steelhead on the left, I believe I'm using red to kind of show you how far upstream they've made it. And I think with coho, I'm using blue. I'm really colorblind. Um, so forgive me if I'm wrong. But on the left, this was after the first year, right? So this was how far the fish had dispersed uh, after the dam was open and after we had moved fish. And what you see is that steelhead made it, uh, this is the former dam site for the former Elwha, here's Glines Canyon. 
That was not passable. Uh, Glines Canyon was not passable until 2015. So in 2011, as far as they could go, was up into Indian Creek, Little River, and then they could make it up to Glines Canyon. You can see the steelhead distributed, you know, maybe another 9 or 15 miles of habitat. But the coho in the first year of recolonization basically took advantage of almost all the habitat that was available. They, they quickly uh, expanded their distribution even more rapidly than steelhead did. So that was kind of interesting. And we go to 2013, which is year three after recolonization. You can see here that we've got coho um, a little more distributed into another creek that runs off to the left. And steelhead now are basically at the same distribution by year three as the coho were in year one. Uh, but they're about even now. And then we go to 2016. So by 2016, Glines Canyon Dam was passable. And you can see that we've got steelhead now that have made it way above Glines Canyon. Uh, but the coho are still petered out, right? They kind of made a glorious first run, and, and then their distribution didn't increase uh, too much. But one of the most important things here is that initially Glines Canyon, even though it was deconstructed in 2014, was not passable because the dynamiting and explosions left behind big rocks, and those rocks created a barrier to movement um, of fish trying to get by them. Um, they blew that up in 2015. Here's a great shot of that by John Gusman. Thank you, John, for that shot. And after that, boy, did fish start moving up. So what we can see now here is 2020, nine years after um, dam removal, the coho have made it a little bit above glines, but not that far, but we have summer steelhead that have basically penetrated uh, as far into the upper L1 now as we think they're ever gonna go. So we have fish that are all the way up to basically what are barriers, uh, at least for steelhead. So that's been a lot of fun to see is that within 10 years, we basically got steelhead back up into places where they hadn't been in 100 years. So I think, you know, it highlights one, dam removal can have a short period of uh, difficulty for the fish, but man, can they recover fast if things are done well? And this is a, just to let everybody know, the Elwha has been closed to fishing since 2010, right? So there's been no fishing in the river at all. And I think a lot of us believe that's been a really critical component of this is, right, is just kind of taking a step back and letting the fish do what they want. So this is a similar figure, but it's for uh, Chinook salmon. And again, it just breaks it down by the same periods one year after dam removal in 2011, three years in 2013, and then now 2029 years. And so Chinook have not made it as far upstream as Steelhead, but they've made it further upstream uh, than Coho. And so the other question is, well, how do we actually count the fish? Because um, we had a lot of sediment in the river and the Elwha is glacial, which means that red counts can be difficult. Snorkel counts aren't always feasible. We have a sonar in the river. We've been running sonar um, since 2009, I think, with Keith Denton. Um, and sonar has worked really well. Here's where the sonar is located, basically about river kilometer 1.2. So it's right down at the mouth. We actually have two sonars because the channel is split into two channels down there. And both those sonars run basically, you know, seven days a week, 24 hours a day during the whole season for steelhead and for Chinook salmon. Uh, and we've got some sampling techniques that we've developed to determine what the ratio of different species are. But it's not that complex. We, we run the sonar, and this gives us a sense then of, of how many fish. And so on the, the left axis over here, that's the total number of Chinook. And on the right axis is total number of steelhead. I'm too colorblind to tell these things apart, but I'm pretty sure steelhead is red. And I can't tell what color Chinook is. You get the point. Oh, are you going through the 90s and 80s? And, and then as soon as dam removal 2012, you see all these much larger run sizes. And what is really cool is that uh, 2021, which was last year, we had the largest winter run, winter steelhead run size on record so far in the Elwha, which was about 2,500 adults. To put that in perspective, that was about the same number of fish as the Ho River got last year. It was far more than the Bogashiel got. So, um, again, within nine to 10 years after dam removal, we're starting to see a nice, really rapid response. Um, these are the Chinook salmon. Now, the Chinook salmon here are a little bit different because most of our Chinook salmon, of course, came from a hatchery population, while the winter steelhead and the summer steelhead, uh, while the winter steelhead had some hatchery fish, there was a, there was a naturally spawning 
wild native population of winter steelhead below the dams that existed. And we had tons of rainbow trout above the dams that could have harbored genes that would um, resume anadromine once the dams were out. But the point here is, again, just as the Elwha Dam is removed and Glines Canyon is removed, right, we're starting to see these kind of positive responses where not only are we getting more fish, but as you see, we're getting more fish further upstream. Uh, again, just a similar um, figure showing how steelhead have responded. So one of the interesting things with Chinook is that because they are hatchery and hatchery fish almost universally survive uh, at much lower rates in the wild than wild fish do, um, you know, when you start planting a large number of hatchery fish and you want them to take off on their own, it's going to take a while for nature to select and operate on those fish. And so what we were seeing basically is that total juvenile production of wild naturally produced Chinook salmon was really low until 2019. And I don't have 2020 and 21 on here, but they show very similar numbers to 2019. And so what we think happened is that survival was quite poor for those hatchery Chinook, partly because they've been domesticated, but also partly because they were spawning in the main stem river mostly, and mostly below uh, one of the two dam sites. So they were spawning in the old lake beds, and those are really dynamic channel areas. So we would expect as the river stabilizes, which it is starting now to do, we're at background levels of uh, in-stream sediment, so the river is running as, as it would be uh, before the dam without any dam vent. So that's nice to know. So basically, as the river is beginning to stabilize, we're starting to see natural production of Chinook increase. So that's another uh, positive sign uh, uh, for us. And this is just a, a figure showing the number of steelhead smolts, and we've got uh, different traps and estimates in here. I wouldn't get too much into that. The point is, is that we're Steelhead smolts are notoriously very difficult to capture in smolt traps, especially in main stem rivers. Those are really large. They're about eight inches in size, and they can just swim around and easily avoid the trap. So efficiencies are low. That's why those error bars around the little estimates are so big. That's what those vertical bars are. That's the error that we have around our estimate. But the point is, is that the natural production of steelhead smolts is increasing, just like it is for Chinook, and that's another good sign. And so... Here's kind of the suite of all three species and what you've seen uh, since the first year of dam removal in 2011. I think we're here to 2020, at least in this figure. So things are looking good. Um, but it's not only adults that are helping us get from kind of point A to point B. These are juvenile Chinook. There's a juvenile steelhead, juvenile coho. And so... Um, Little River is one of our intensively monitored creeks that we spend a lot of time in, and we do a census of all the reds in the creek each year, doing red counts, and then we do a census in the summer, come back and do a snorkel survey to count the juvenile. And so here we broke every reach down into basically a 100-meter reach, and what you see is that is where we counted the reds of adult coho. And then what you look down below is this is where we counted the juveniles, right? So there's a bunch of gaps in between where the adults were distributed, right? And then as juveniles begin to disperse, they fill in those gaps. So more of the habitat gets utilized by the juveniles than by the adults. But importantly, we're seeing this in the main stem too, is that, in other words, this means that even though you might've had a few adults spawn in one location in a creek or a river, that their juveniles have the capacity to disperse quite a, quite a long ways, you know, um, hundreds of meters to a few kilometers. Uh, and still have their survival be relatively high. So that's kind of been uh, a fun aspect of this. But I think the most exciting aspect of this for me has been the resurgence of wild summer steelhead. And here on the left, we have Eleanor Chittenden in 1907 with about a 13-pound wild summer steelhead from the upper Elwha caught on a fly rod. And then on the right is the very first summer steelhead that I saw making above any of the dams, and that was October 2012, and I was fortunate enough to have my camera with me that day when I saw that fish. Um, so before the dams came out, there were very few summer steelhead. They were basically almost an extant, uh, extinct life history. Now, below the dams, we might see one or two each year. Sometimes they were clipped, likely strays from somewhere else. Uh, other times they weren't. But again, we knew that we had thousands of resident rainbow trout above the dams, and there's a tremendous amount of research as 
as folks probably know if they've heard me talk before, that rainbow trout and steelhead, same species, they can give rise to each other, right? And, and rainbow trout um, can give rise to steelhead. And we've got a number of examples of that happening in the literature. So the cool thing is in 2016, the Park Service went up and they counted like 20 something or 30 steelhead. And then the next year we expanded the survey a little bit more, counted like 60. In 2018, we decided to do a full riverscape and counted like 230. In 2019, I don't have the last years on here. In 2019, we got to like 330 uh, steelhead counted in our um, snorkel survey. And the important thing is that we use, in 2019, and since we've been using Mark Resites, so we're capturing steelhead in the lower river with stains and then tagging them with white tanks so we can do Mark Resites so that snorkelers go through and they tell us and record the number of fish that are marked and seen and those that are unmarked and seen. And that allows us to model or estimate population size because these are just the raw snorkel count numbers. They don't tell us about how many fish are actually there. And one reason this is important is that there's a five mile section uh, called the Grand Canyon that we're not allowed to snorkel on the Elwalk because they're too dangerous. It's class five whitewater for kayakers. So it's a, it's a really uh, a tough place to be. At some point I'm gonna get in there and, and snorkel some of it. But the point is we can't survey all the habitat in the upper Elwalk. But again, just to let folks know how hard it is, we have to hike about uh, 15 to 30 miles into the upper Elwha using pack wheels and everything else. And then we're hiking anywhere from three to 10 miles in a day to do these surveys in water that's about 48 degrees. So it's, you know, it seems like a kick in the pants, but I can tell you at age 50, it is not that easy to hike in 17 miles on the first day and, and go up 3,000 feet in elevation, you know, carrying all your gear. So what we have here, and I'm sorry, this is a little skewed, um, which is this is our population estimate going back to 2019 when we had the 300 fish. This is what the 300 fish actually means when we plug it into a model and account for all the fish that we didn't see. The bottom is a binomial model. The upper one's a hypergeometric. Uh, they both work well. Uh, I tend to prefer the binomial model. Regardless, the point is that within four years of that upper dam being removed, we had almost a thousand summer steelhead in the upper Elwha. That is more summer steelhead that year than we had on the entire Olympic Peninsula combined. We've been out of all of those. In fact, it's probably now almost certainly the largest single wild population of summer steelhead that we have anywhere in coastal Washington. Uh, that we can get that response. Now, the numbers recently have declined. We've had bad ocean years, but we also think that this is pretty normal for fish to go through ebbs and flows early in their colonization process as they're trying to figure out which life histories work. So last year was a really low count for us. The population was probably back down to around 200, you know, fish or something like that. But this is again, part of that normal process that uh, these fish go through. So the big question, the cool one is, where are these fish coming from, right? Where are those summer steelhead coming from? And so summer steelhead have a gene that we call GREB1L, right? And I'm just gonna refer to that as the summer steelhead gene. And if you if you are an individual and you're homozygote for that gene, which means that you have two pairs that are dominant, then you are a summer steelhead. You have no say in the matter. Your genes control that. Now, if you have one of those genes or none of GREB1L, you're a winter run. And so we, what we saw here is that indeed the summer run adults that we were sampling have the summer run genotype, right? These fish that are coming back and the winter runs that we're sampling mostly have the winter run genotype. Now, some of the winter runs we sampled had summer run genotype. And this is because we're using time of year to tell us about when the fish are sampled. We're also catching, um, so some winter steelhead enter in June and July for us and some summer runs do. So we have some overlap. And then we have this light blue box up here, which are heterozygotes. And those are fish that are also probably caught during a period of time of year when it's a little bit in the middle, right, for these fish. But the main point is our summer steelhead show this GREB1L, and I think that's red or whatever color gene. And so now we can look at, okay, what do we see pre-dam? We have AD, ID, and BD. AD is uh, uh, after dam removal, I mean uh, above dams. ID is in between the dams and BD is below the dams. But the main point here is let's look at what was above the dams pre-dam is we had all of that summer steelhead gene and those were all found in resident rainbow trout. And then after dam removal, we've got 
that number has diminished. But what you see is that the number of that summer steel, the proportion of the summer steelhead genotype that we're seeing is now starting to show up at a higher rate in the below dam area. And so that just means that we're catching adults that were generated by rainbow trout, right? That rainbow trout played a very important role because uh, pre-dam, we did not have any genotypes for the summer steelhead, right? Below the dam, they just didn't exist. And so they only started to show up after dam removal. So I think, again, this just highlights that dam removal isn't just about rebuilding abundance. It's about rebuilding diversity in life histories. I mean, this is, this is as cool to me as trying to bring back a woolly mammoth to life, right? You know, Eleanor Chittenden was one of the last people probably to see some of these true wild summer runs almost 100 years ago. So in summary, uh, steelhead keep moving up. Um, you know, further upstream each year, they've kind of almost reached a peak. Uh, the summer runs are now over 20 miles above glines. They've really penetrated those headwaters. Uh, coho, they're, they're really broadly distributed, but this really isn't a big coho river. But none, nonetheless, we're seeing juveniles move around the watershed a lot and fill in certain places. Uh, and the Chinook are moving far upstream also like steelhead. Uh, the natural production has begun to ramp up since the river has stabilized. And I guess we also have some questions about other species, such as Pacific lamprey. Uh, so they were making it right through there um, as soon as the dams were out. And if I had any guess now, lamprey are probably the most abundant anandromous fish that we have in the Elwha that are being naturally produced. And then bull trout, it's another cool story. Uh, very scarce, very small in size, below dam removal, uh, before dam removal, down below the dams. Uh, but the bull trout that were trapped above the dams immediately resumed anadromy. It's increased their size because they've gotten older in age and their condition has gotten better. So uh, that's really helped the bull trout. And last but not least, my little, one of my favorite birds in the world is, what have these anadromous fish done to the dipper? Well, some pretty cool stuff. Uh, it didn't do much for the males, right? Which is to be expected because sperm is cheap and, and eggs are costly. But what you see here is that um, this is a mass index, right? For each of these birds. And so you can see that females without anadromous fish had a significantly lower body mass index than those that were exposed to anadromous fish. And these measurements were taken out of Little River before and after the river was opened up for anadromy. So one of the things that we saw were the dippers just going crazy, right? There were so many eggs and so much flesh for them to eat that it was just, you know, glorious to them, it seemed like to me. It looked like a little slice of Alaska. So um, in closing, uh, that's it. You know, thank you very much. And if there's any questions, uh, feel free to let me know. Okay, well, uh, rather than use chat, uh, why, don't, why don't you guys in Zoom that want to ask questions, unmute yourself. And our, um, our mic is open here in the room. And so we'll just let people in the room ask questions as well one at a time. Anybody have questions? Yeah, I do. <laughs> hey, hey, John, what happens when, uh, you know, a hatchery fish returns and mates with a, a wild fish? Do the offspring match the behavior of the wild or the hatchery fish? You know, is there a... Yeah, it depends on the species, you know, but universally they they just do not survive as well so you don't you know it depends um summer steelhead we tend to see more introgression um for some reason than we do in winter runs uh with hatchery fish but generally it looks like the most common uh outcome is uh at least with stocks that are you know should be clear because there's kind of two types of hatchery programs, right? There's these kind of old traditional programs that run algae stock, the Scamania stock. Those programs, those fish, you know, their survival in nature is 10, 20 percent, right? So when they breed with a wild fish, the genes just basically disappear from the from the population. And when you start getting into brood stock and these other things that derived at some point, you know, more recently from wild fish or used wild fish it still looks like survival is really pretty poor. Um, it's not as low and it varies, um, but they don't survive as well and they don't have the same, you know, they're an intermediate to a hatchery in a wild and that's probably why they don't survive as well, right? As one animal has been selected to do really well in a hatchery and the other in nature 
and and that mismatch inevitably results in you know poor survival for the uh, the hybrid between the two. Not always, right? I mean, there are some cases where, but generally, on average, their survival is is lower, and it can be anywhere from you know five to ten percent at a small level up to you know sixty to seventy to eighty percent. It depends kind of on the study and and on how they measure it. Other questions in the room? So John, do you think your results were unique to the river or would these be typical kinds of results you would see on any dam removal or what, what was unique about the river? Well, you know, we are opening access to basically what is untouched habitat, right? So that's different, you know, I live in a place where we literally do, you know, this is one of the, the Olympic National Park is one of the very last truly untouched places in the lower 48. You know, people can say that there are national parks in California, there's some around in different places, but they, this has not been inhabited by Europeans for very long, right? None of this doesn't have a, you know, it's different. So the pristine habitat makes a difference, right? I think that makes a difference. But otherwise, to me, it's, it's, to be expected, I would have expected a rapid response and a good one. All the papers that I've read on dam removal um, for steelhead and other salmon show pretty rapid responses of the fish to the improved access to these headwater habitats. And for me, that's why removing the Snake River is so, you know, those snake dams is so important because there's no way with climate change and the pace it's moving that those fish are going to persist in the Columbia being as warm as it is. And it has nothing really to do even with the warm temperature itself. It's just that we've literally filling up the Columbia with a bunch of exotic species that I could give two rats about, right? I, I hate walleye <laughs> and I hate bass, you know? I don't want any of them in there, right? People want those and go back to the Midwest and catch them. So part of the concept of breaching dams is you recreate habitat that favored salmon and does not favor those other fish. I mean, there's only one reason we have pike minnow in the Columbia that exceed 24 inches. It's because it's a bunch of stagnant water, right? If you cranked up the, the velocity in the main stem Columbian Snake River, those fish are all gonna be pushed to the margins and edges like they were historically. So I, I go back to, I think dam removal is critical, right? That we need free flowing rivers. I also think the hydropower is, I hate to say it, but it's old news and it's not clean power. And we have so many other great options for power right now than, than hydropower. Um, but I understand it's a challenge, but nonetheless, I think the snake dams, they absolutely have to come out, you know, if we want those fish to persist into the future. And if we want to give, you know, tribal or recreational anglers a chance to be fishing for those fish in 50 years. So I do think dam removal is important. I think the Elwha is a bit unique because we have really pristine habitat. But that said, I think, you know, places in the snake it's not totally pristine, but you're still providing access to a lot of relatively intact habitat, and it's habitat that is predicted to be a refuge uh, for cold water fish as the climate warms. So I'm excited about dam removal. I'm excited to see what happens in the Klamath. I think it's going to be another success. And it shouldn't be surprising because all of these fish have basically evolved to live with this stuff throughout their evolutionary history, right? This is their trick. Salmon have evolved through volcanism, glaciation, huge floods, forest fires, drought. Um, you know, when glaciation was at its peak, it's likely that, you know, Mexico was full of steelhead. So we have to think about that at times. There are rivers that drain to Mazatlan that their headwaters have uh, large, relatively robust populations of native trout that were related to old cutthroat and steelhead. So the distribution of steelhead and salmon at this point in time is is different from what it was, you know, from for much of their history. So I think they're uniquely adapted to dealing with these short-term challenges um, and environmental difficulties, which is why I'm excited to see the Klamath and and hopefully, you know, the snake come out in my lifetime. Well, John, if if dam removal is one of the answers, we have a number of coastal streams that are not dammed, and yet the salmon and steelhead population on those are 
drastically low. Um, I mean, I, I understand dam removal is is one part of the picture, but you know, you have the ocean conditions and everything else. So, why don't we see a a big improvement in the the salmon and steelhead numbers on our undammed coastal streams? I think that's pretty clear, Tim. Is we're fishing the crap out of them and we're playing hatchery fish all over them, right? I mean, this is the difference is that there's no way you're going to recover salmon or steelhead, wild ones at least, fishing at the level that we fish at, right? I mean, uh, it's absolutely impossible. And all my friends that are modelers can generate you a stock recruit curve and say that they can harvest this, but everywhere we've applied our fishery models, everything's gone down the crapper, right? So, I mean, um, yeah, you know, not fishing right makes a huge difference that allows fish to rebuild diversity uh spatial distribution other attributes they don't have um so i go back to but i would also say that you know you go back to all of when we think of why the salmon are depleted it's not like as simple as ocean conditions and I, there's a number of reasons i can give you that for example we know that the size of the fish the size of the steelhead small for example determines its survival rate when it enters the salt water. What we don't know is if our smolts are now smaller than they used to be historically because there's less food in our systems. So we don't know whether ocean survival has declined because of things that we've done to the fish themselves or it's truly because ocean conditions have fallen apart, right? We don't have data going back to the 1940s that's going to tell us about ocean productivity. So we get, we get, we get a very simple, palatable uh, description of this generally from the media and most scientists, but it's more complex. And I think anytime you look at where we have strongholds, where fish are doing really well, generally they have high quality habitat or higher, their fisheries are better managed, right? And they have fewer hatchery fish. And I, I would give you Oregon Coast Coho as a great example. You know, Oregon Coast Coho were completely down in the crapper and they spent tens of millions of dollars trying to restore the habitat and the habitat restoration didn't work. So they reduced the ocean harvest by 75%, and they dramatically reduced the hatcheries by even more. And, you know, in the mid-2010s, you had numbers of wild coho that returned to the Oregon coast that you hadn't seen since the 1950s. So you show me another river where you've taken that kind of action. You know, these are the actions, big, bold actions are what these fish need. And I looked at places, too, like the Middle Columbia, you know, where it's doing pretty well, right? And the Middle Columbia steelhead, for some reason, are surviving at much higher rates. And one option is it's the place with the fewest amount of hatchery steelhead in the entire Columbia. So we, we talk about these things as, like, there are some really pretty clear patterns where we've done well and where we haven't. So I guess I would say that dam removal works, but in and of itself, you could protect the best habitat in the world and you're not going to have any fish. We can look to Alaska. Um, the decline in all the kings in Alaska, look, that's because they've been over-harvesting immature Chinook for over 150 years. And so places are closing in Alaska. I think the Yukon fishery closed this year. Nothing to do with habitat. And it's not because the ocean has gotten any worse. Uh, I, I wouldn't doubt that it has. But it's because we're shrinking the size of king salmon and every species has an evolutionary calling card that makes them unique, that makes them successful. Like if you're Kobe Bryant, it's a turnaround jumper like Michael Jordan had. Nobody could stop it, right? If you're Shaq, it's a dunk. If it's Tim Duncan, you can make your free throws and rebound. For Chinook, it's about being big. You've got to be 50 to 100 pounds. If you're 10 to 20 pounds, you're basically a coho salmon, glorified, right? For steelhead, you've got to have a lot of repeat spawning, a lot of rainbow trout, and a lot of diversity. Coho salmon, beaver ponds, a low gradient habitat. But my point is that every species has something they require. And the more we take away from each of those fish, each of them has a different solution because they each have a different problem that they face. So I, I hope that's a, a long-winded way of saying that one of the reasons we're seeing what we're seeing in the Elwha is because we're not fishing. You know, we've allowed the fish to do what they want and our trajectories and runs are changing uh, are not coinciding with what we see in all our other nearby rivers that we are fishing. Um, so I think it, again, highlights how important it is to better manage um, our fisheries and our hatchery programs. John, I have a question. 
Oh, yeah, Cindy. Oh, um, the the tags that the steelhead or that you guys are using on steelhead up on the Elwa are that you said they're radio tags, or are they just some are, some are. So, so not into the ocean, but we once they see. Are you? Why do we not track them when they're out back to sea? Well, we're starting to mainly because it's been tech limited is that um, they, they haven't had the technology, you know, because these, these transmitters require batteries. And so you're hoping to find one fish out in the ocean for a bat and you can't get a battery that will run long enough on that small, you know, and then you've got to actually have receivers out in the ocean frequently enough. So it's only been relatively recently that we've been looking at it more in detail, but that said, we have like literally 70 years of har 80 years of harvest data. We know where all the steelhead are in the open ocean because of all the net data. They're not netted very frequently. They're not caught that much, but we, we know where they're going, um, you know, and, and kind of, we don't know where individual stocks are going in any given point in time, but we do have general sense of, you know, like our fish in the North go out further into the North Pacific. Than, than fish from where you folks are at, right? And as you get down into Southern Oregon and California, a lot of those fish don't even head off the continental shelf. Um, so there's, there's different migrations, but they have very strict temperature limits. And this is the concern that I have overall over the course of the next 50 years. I mean, I think conservative climate change models now predict a two foot sea level rise by 2050, right? So what is that? 28 years, two feet. It's going to be more than that, right? It's probably going to be five, six, right? Scientists underpredict this stuff. There's uh, massive glaciers. We're not accounting for all the fossil methane. The concern that I would have, and to me this is serious, is that, look, we're going to increase the ocean level so much that it's just going to make it a really warm, soupy mess uh, and probably more acidic. So you can see over evolutionary period, we've got climate data for temperature going back, um, estimates going back 300 million years. And we can see over that 300 million year period, there's this very narrow five million year period, very recently when salmon evolved and the ocean actually got cold enough for us to have salmon. Uh, and unfortunately, steelhead are pretty thermally tolerant. So they do better in a warmer ocean than a lot of these other fish. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, T minus 2050, because if our sea level is truly two feet higher in 2000, you know, it just seems like the water chemistry changes will be so great. So that, that worries me about our ocean migration, which means, Chandy, in short, you might be catching lots of half pounders after 2050 if we don't <laughs> get our act together as humans. Because <laughs> I think that's what we'll have. Uh, so yeah. that's the, so the migration, say, for your, for like Olympic Peninsula, B.C., are they doing like a? Are they heading to Japan, kind of, and doing that migration, that jet stream, or? Well, it depends. So, the difference, how far a fish goes in the open ocean, depends on how old it will mature. So, mm -hmm. one reason that Southern Oregon and um, Northern California, at least, you know, there's more smaller fish than we have now. Your winter runs tend to be bigger, but summer runs. So. That's not always the way it was, but small, you know, if a fish is four pounds, it is a one-year-old probably. So a one-year-old wouldn't have as much time to migrate or energy to migrate out as far as a two-year-old. And so there's basically loops, right? A one-year-old goes that far and comes back and a two-year-old is a little bit further. And then a three-year-old is even further. And then the fours and fives, the very rare, the huge fish are way out there. But what we see is that for our steelhead, basically from the Columbia River north, they don't spend any time on the continental shelf like salmon do. They immediately shoot off the continental shelf and go to the high seas, uh, and then they're out there. And, you know, it's unlikely that our one- and two-year-olds are going out that far, but we got three and fours. They're probably going out to the Bering Sea, off the Aleutian Islands, Kamchatka Peninsula, stuff and like are they, that. are they pelagic? Are they going super deep, or are they pretty, like, subsurface? No. They have to be almost at the surface because steelhead do not, the steelhead are a very old salmonid and all the ancient salmonids were resident first. They weren't, you know, anadromy and being able to go to the ocean is recent, right? Really recent for salmon. Uh, huh. 
Um, and that's how we got all these different species, like coho, chinook, sockeye. They're all young, like steelhead, cutthroat, bull trout. They're old. Whitefish are old. You know, whitefish are, I mean, that's, you know, they're old, old, salmonid, right? So all the oldest ones are resident. So steelhead have a very limited ability to withstand the higher salinities that salmon like chinook and coho do. So they have to stay in the upper 15 meters of the water column in the open uh, ocean. Huh. Interesting. Almost universally, yeah, they're in the upper, upper uh, fifteen meters. That's really interesting. So, you said uh, you've recently changed positions, jobs. Are you going to be? Yeah. yeah. Are you going to be uh, snorkeling fish on the OA anymore? Or are you going to be just mostly in the courtroom? Oh yeah, no Elwha for sure, but there'll probably be some some more litigation out of me now. I've 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 you know, look I've watched my dad doing everybody else. You know what I mean? It's just uh, the agencies have had their chance, right? And it's universally almost failed, considering where we're at and what we're about to go through. So yeah, uh, look if you look at the animals that we've recovered, they all required substantial litigation. Peregrine falcon, bald eagle. You know, you go through the whooping crane, you go through all this stuff. It takes a lot to save an animal, right? To kind of get yeah. us out of our own way at times. And not meaning all of us here as individuals, right? I mean, we're all, but you know, it, it's, it's hard. And my job is I don't think I can save every population. Again, I'm just really focused on, you know, the very last best places that I want to leave something behind. I'm not worried about those that are at the end of the bench that are already kind of destroyed and, and don't have much chance to me at a realistic recovery. I'm talking about the last 10, 12 best steelhead rivers we have in the lower 48. Um, what there's still a lot of you... science, you know. Uh, uh, what, which ones do I think? Are yeah, where, where do you where do you like to go uh, look at fish? Well, I, you know, I don't travel much, right? I mean, unless I have to. So I live most of my life up here on the OP, which is where I'm at, or I go to, you know, BC up on the island. Um, but I've been throughout pretty much every, I've been in every steelhead watershed in the lower 48. Um, I've swam in probably 80% of them, but I, I like my uh, rivers up here on the OP. Yeah. So we all have our favorites, right? I mean, it's, it's just the way it is. So are you involved at all with the BC steelhead stuff? Because that sounds pretty tragic right now. The, the what? Well, I'm familiar with it. But what I didn't the BC the decline, yeah. Because it's it yeah, sounds like that is tough. I mean, because they had a good thing going there for up until 15 years ago or something, and now they've really gone backwards. In, in the Thompson or the, yeah, Fraser in that area, yeah. Yeah, I think you know the Thompson. I mean, it it's been happening. You know, it's. There's work coming out suggesting that the most likely explanation for our big decline in steelhead range wide last year was not just the change in ocean currents that are happening, but there are so many hatchery pink salmon that were planting in the North Pacific that were swamping the area with food. And the Thompson River steelhead have been very tightly correlated, their demise with the planting of these pink salmon. And pink salmon are pretty easy to determine their effect because they're odd even your fish, right? So you can pick their signal out really clearly. In fact, we're showing that Alaska is releasing like over a billion of these things. They're negatively affecting the size of Chinook and survive, size and survival of Chinook and Puget Sound and the Columbia. So uh, they're correlated with the decline of Thompson steelhead. But it looks, what has happened in the Thompson is that some combination of that combined with the fact that they've been bycatching those steel had a very high rate in commercial salmon fisheries um, throughout the main stem Fraser and Canada never addressed it. And, but Canada, you know, BC and the provincial, you know, even the Canadian government just, they won't do what's right, right? There are some good people there, but the federal Canadian government, DFO is a problem. So I think Thompson Steelhead are done for. So, John, Tell us um, how you keep your chin up in these times. What, what kind of? I mean, I personally, yeah. know what what you've done on social media. Um, what keeps you moving well, forward? 
positive motion. You know, places like the Elwha, but I've I've also lived through this, and I've you know uh, my family's been out here for you know since the late 1800s, and so they've seen the good and the bad. You know, you live through the good and the bad. I mean, you know, in the mid 90s, the crash that we had in the Columbia. Uh, for Steelhead was just as dramatic. That was the time when Larry Schoenbord started to go out of business. Kaufman's fly shop started to struggle. I've, I've been through this before. And so that's part of it, right? If you've been, been through it before, you know you expect to turn around, which will happen. Although I think we're running out of time on, on that in, <laughs> in the long haul. The second reason is places like the Elwha. Look, we know how to get ourselves out of this mess. It's really clear. We have places that are successful. We've got to manage our fisheries better, right? That's the, it comes down to it so often that if we're investing millions of dollars in habitat. The runs are getting worse. We refuse to address our fisheries and hatchery production. And so we continue to operate like that. Unless we're going to turn those dials in a big way, I think we're probably going to stay in the same place. But I would also say that I'm a fighter. I grew up in a little town, you know, and um, I worked at a pulp mill. And I enjoy the fight, right? Like, yeah, there's, you know, Muhammad Ali doesn't step in the ring because he doesn't like the fight. You know, I mean, I enjoy the debates that take place here. And I feel that, you know, I want to change something and leave something better for the future. So even though I might have to make some sacrifices now, more than willing to do that. You know, I mean, it, it, it fits my personality to be in a fight at times. So I would say this, though, look, I mean, salmon aren't, salmonids are not going to go extinct. You're always going to have trout or something in fresh water. These fish will always persist there, you know, but it is worrisome, right? I'm not sure that you're talking 20, 70, or 80 that there are any more, you know what I mean? I don't know that we're fishing for salmon anymore. Uh, it'll be, um, Bad, but, my whole uh, by 20, by 20. <laughs> But by, seriously, by 2080, if we're not fishing for salmon, that'll be the least of our problems because, look, yeah, we're not, we're completely unprepared as a civilization, right, to deal with five to 10 feet level of sea rise and all the stuff that comes with it. So, uh, and the cool thing is, the most hopeful thing of all is that when they originally started modeling the effects of climate change back in the early 80s and late 70s, it was actually before that, but some of the first complex models and this looks like it could unfold, we're only going to be in a warm spot for a short period of time. It's going to revert back to an ice age probably pretty quickly into this, um, like a like a full-on, you know, everybody's seen that movie, but that's the real, as we disrupt these currents and we get too much fresh water on top of the salt water, it disrupts the conveyor belt and the upwelling and downwelling and circulation. And most people aren't aware that like a place like Great Britain and, um, you know, like um, New York City, are really high latitudes. And the only reason that they're really habitable for long period, you know, they'd be more, much more like Norway, right, if we didn't have those circulation systems. So I think that I always go back to that, you know, Shandy, we just eat because literally, I mean, the science looks so terrible for humans in 50 years that fish will be, fish will be fine in 150 after we've done whatever we've done to ourselves. And it starts to cool off again. That's that's kind of my my opinion on it. Um, so I keep some hope that nature bats last. You know, nature will always bat last. I think we lost him and the room. It sounds like. <laughs> so it's just. I think it's. I think we're only. It's the Zoom people that are left. So technology on our side has won. <laughs> um, does anyone have any more questions for John? Too many. Anyone? Enjoyed the presentation quite a bit, though. I'll tell you that. You did a good job. Yep. John, can you let Thank everyone you, we'll put a hyperlink for your um, Instagram account? But um, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Rainforest underscore steel is my Instagram. If you all are on there, and some over the course of the next year, um, I'm going to be explaining some more of this stuff to folks that are interested. Like, I've walked people through a lot of this before, and sometimes the things I say may come as a surprise because, look, I love this, right? This is my entire life. I spend all my time either, you know, swimming, fishing, or reading, or, you know, conducting research. And so, 
you know, it's fun to share it, but I also understand that most, most of the time that folks get their information, it comes in a, in a way that's filtered such that, you know, it's all the ocean or it's all this, or there's, you know, and it's not, it's, it's just really, truly much more complex than it's often given credit for. But at the same time, it is also that simple that they just need good habitat. We can't kill too many of them. They need their diversity. And if we do those things to allow these fish to um, persist, I think that we can continue to have fisheries. And so I'm convinced, you know, that we're going to keep working, put the shoulder to the wheel, and, you know, hopefully kids in 20 or 30 years have another chance to fish with these fish. That's right. For our members who have grandchildren or you know, adult children, really have a look at John's Instagram account because he makes learning super entertaining. His analogies are really easy in layman's terms um, and just some really beautiful photography and videography. It's definitely well worth sharing with um, your friends and family, especially the young ones, super fun. Thank you, Shandy. And um, I, I do wanna say that that's my constituency, right? Like. It's the grandkids, man. I'm not doing this for me to fish or frankly, any of us that are sitting here right now, right? I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I assume if we all got together, we'd have a great time with a beer and, a, and some good food. And that doesn't mean I appreciate it, but I really, I felt like fish helped me get through so much in life. And I want other kids to have that opportunity, you know, to, to experience nature and feel like, you know, they love something that much. Absolutely. All right, guys, should we let John go to bed? <laughs> Thank you I very much. So. Yeah, that so was much. awesome. Thank you, John. It. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll, it will have, oh, and if you all folks want to see, we did, a, we made a video. I'll send a link to Shandy and Tim because we have a video, you know, on the Elwha Summer Steelhead up there. Um, I'll send you, I'll send a link to some research papers to Shandy and, and Tim also that we just published on the LWA for anybody that wants to look at them. That'd be cool. And I'll also do the link for Shane Anderson's film as well so that, you know, there's just so, so cool. much cool stuff to watch and to get a better gist, better look. But thank yeah, you. Yeah. Can't well, thank wait you. for and, and great to meet everyone. To get to Russia. Yeah. Can't wait for updates eventually. Thank you, everyone. All right. Good night. Thanks, good night. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.